Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Going Nuts About Tree Nuts, Learn What's Changed in Tree Nut Allergy. I am Jennifer Gertz, Executive Director of Food Allergy Canada, and our guest speaker today is Dr. Doug Mack. Before we get started, I wanted to note a few items. Note that this session is for informational purposes only and will not provide specific medical advice, recommendations, diagnosis, or treatment. Please talk to your doctor about any concerns or questions you may have regarding your own health or the health of your child. All participants are muted so we can keep the audio clear for the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and shared on foodallergycanada.ca afterwards. And lastly, thanks to everyone who submitted questions on registration. There are some very common questions and we're gonna tackle them in today's session. If you have additional questions throughout, please submit them in the question box and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Now, a little background on this session. It's going to be all about tree nut allergy. We chose this time of year for this webinar when tree nuts are more top of mind, when mixed bowls of nuts appear on holiday tables and those with a tree nut allergy are likely to be thinking more about it. Some of you in the listening audience may have been diagnosed decades ago with a tree nut allergy and told to avoid all nuts. And others of you may have an infant or toddler with a single tree nut allergy, say cashew, and have been advised to introduce other tree nuts into their diet. How do we make sense of this contradictory approach? What underpins this changing paradigm? Even though it's a busy time of year, we've been able to secure an expert on this subject to help us understand the current research what we know now that we didn't know 10 years ago, and the things you might consider on managing tree nut allergy going forward. Our session will cover four areas. We'll have our expert walk us through a few slides and then we'll break for some a uh, couple of times for questions, taking some of those questions that you've pre-submitted and, and the additional ones that are asked throughout. Where the four sections are setting the context, what is and isn't tree nut allergy, what are common combinations, what's its prevalence, then talk about changing paradigms. Why is the paradigm changing? What underpins this? Managing avoidance. What's the practicality of managing a tree nut allergy? And then lastly, leaving with a section on moving forward, ending with some things for us to consider going forward. Is there an action I might consider? Or does this reinforce for me that I'll continue with my current approach to managing my tree nut allergy? Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Mack. Dr. Mack is a pediatric allergy, asthma, and immunology speci specialist. He is an cl assistant clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics at McMaster University and on the board of directors for the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. He's also on the executive for the Allergy and Immunology for the Ontario Medical Association. Thank you, Dr. Mack, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today and to give us insight into this topic. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, I really want to thank everyone for coming today. I think it's going to be a, just a, a fun discussion to have, and I I, I think this is um, this may be uh, a lot of really new news for some of you. This may be something that is troubling for you, and and I and I and I want to kind of just um, be sensitive to that as we walk through this. I mean, I think some of this, is, as we learn more, the thing I like about science is that as we learn more, we can modify uh, what we've done. Um, and, and what we do moving forward, but sometimes that poses challenges for patients that have have taken approaches that were based on the current science at the time, whether it was optimal or not. So let's talk about this. I want to walk you through kind of what is a tree nut and 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 talk about some of these changing paradigms. Uh, I want to talk about how to how can we practically manage avoidance in light of these changing strategies and what can we do about this moving forward uh, and I think um, I, I think this will at least um, spark some some thought about how we do this and and um, and, and I think this will be hopefully a, a robust discussion so let's go here there we go so first question I you know I want to just kind of put it out there is peanut a tree nut? Okay, it is. Peanuts are legumes. They grow underground. We, you know, we just call them nut. That's it. Okay, they're not nuts, and, and um, they're not botanically related to tree nuts. Yes, they are plant-based, but they are not specifically related to the group of tree nuts. Um, and I'm going to go further on that, but I, I want to say that just off the bat because I often hear families. Uh, who have a peanut reaction, the child has a peanut reaction, 
and they're and they're told to avoid all tree nuts. And I'm going to walk you through that. But in general, once again, this is not the same. This is not the same uh, um, um, food. This is very very different. And I and I think uh, once again we've kind of named it a nut, but it isn't even a nut per se. It's completely separate. So let's go on to the tree nut specifically. I just want to get that out of the way. So what is a tree nut? Okay, so I'm not a botanist. I'm going to just say that I am an allergist, a pediatric allergist. That's what I do. And when we look at nuts, tree nuts specifically, the way that, that botanists define that is that there's a hard shelled dry fruit or seed with a separable rind or shell and an interior kernel. Okay. What we kind of do as a society is decide that tree nuts are a collective term to describe any nut that grows on a tree. That makes sense. I get that. What's interesting about this is that the majority of what we call tree nuts are actually not nuts at all, just to kind of confuse this picture even more. The majority are what we call droops. You can Google that and see what that looks like. Um, but here's what a droop looks like. So if anyone, I'd never seen almonds uh, until I went to my, my, my family's from Australia. We went back to visit some of my family there and, and I saw an almond tree. I didn't know what this was. It looked like a small peach. And this is what an almond looks like growing on a tree. Maybe, maybe you've never seen this. I, I certainly hadn't until a couple of years back. Um, and it has this kind of peach-like fruit on it and inside looks like a bit of a peach pit. And then when you crack that open, that's the almond, okay? And I think, so it is, it is, it is, it is a fruit that has a seed uh, um, inside there. Um, now, I don't want you now to, uh, to think about that. Now we have to avoid all, you know, peaches or things that look like this, but this is, this is what this looks like. And I think it kind of makes it even um, a bit more challenging to even know what, what is a tree nut. So let's go through kind of some of the main, what we call tree nuts. So we have, seven main families and i'm going to kind of walk you through this specifically but in this kind of botanical grouping that that we have colloquially termed tree nuts there are seven main families um and you can see there that they are all separate um almonds brazil nuts cashews <coughs> sorry pistachios hazelnuts macadamia etc cetera, etc cetera. there are some small crossovers between these and i'm going to kind of go through that and just to, to tell you what those those numbers look like but these are distinct plant groups okay um and, and i think that's an important thing that we are starting to recognize that these are while we have um, given them the umbrella term tree nuts they actually come from different families i don't expect you to remember a, a betelucia but anyways there we are that's 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 uh, but you can bring that up at a coffee table discussion this over, over christmas when you see nuts on the table but we have um, in the government of Canada has has determined that these are now priority allergens. So you will see this as an umbrella term for one of the priority allergens. So tree nuts. Actually, I've highlighted, you know, if you talk to a botanist, the only true this is interesting. The only true tree nut on this list as outlined um, as outlined by Health Canada is actually hazelnuts. That's it. OK, um, the others are once again considered droops for the for the most part. Um, and and so this is kind of an interesting phenomenon. You know, I, I think we have we've, we've 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 classified them as such. But in the end, I think the question I often ask myself is, does it matter whether I call them tree nuts? Does it matter whether I call them droops? Does it matter whether I consider some of these seeds? I mean, how do I? How do I conceptualize this? And I think that that grouping that we showed earlier, just about the differences in in um, family groups, I think is a really important concept for us to kind of consider. Um, does it actually matter specifically? In some scenarios, it does. But as a group, does it matter whether we call these tree nuts or, or, or droops? Maybe we should just have it, call them droop allergies. So let's go over this. Uh, these were from pre-submitted questions. So some of the ones that you guys had sent in earlier were, you know, what is a tree nut? Um, and here are a couple. So coconut, uh, chestnut, nutmeg, shea, pink peppercorn. So let's go through this. Coconut. In Canada, we don't consider the tree nut. Now, the USDA, the, the Food and Drug Administration, actually does call uh, coconut a, a tree nut. Okay, because it's from a tree. And it's kind of a nut. It's actually once again a droop, um, and, um, and and so it kind of depends on where you're living. But once again, how does that change our management? Chestnut actually is considered a true tree nut. 
uh, very much like hazelnut or acorns. If you can think about the way those look, they have that kind of hard outer shell. And, and, that's, and that's actually what we would consider a, a tree nut. Nutmeg is not, just says the word nut in it, it is absolutely not a tree nut. Shea, not a tree nut, pink peppercorns, once again, not related. Okay, that doesn't mean that patients couldn't react to the, any of these. I actually have never seen a true nutmeg or nutmeg or shea or a pink peppercorn allergy, but but um, but it is. But these are not considered both in the United States or in Canada um, by any definition a nut. Nutmeg, once again, just has the name nut in it. It is absolutely not a nut. So how common is, tr is tree nut allergy in Canada? Um, we think it affects about 1.4% of Canadians. Now these numbers are often, can be a little bit higher some years, a little bit lower, depending on how you kind of determine the, the, um, the diagnosis. Um, but it, in adults, it's, it's one of the top three and in children, okay? And, and I think this is something to, that really does um, um, make us concerned. I, I think this is something that, that in adults, this is a very common, cause of reaction and, and as well in kids. So we do see this a lot and I'm gonna walk you through some of how we diagnose that. But I think here, you know, I actually just Googled, you know, I was trying to find a, you know, general advice. Well, what are people seeing on the internet about avoiding nuts? And I think this is where our challenge arrives. So this is just about, you know, is chestnut a nut and they're going through this and I've highlighted on the bottom there. This was the advice from this allergy foodie is what they call themselves. And it says, so those with a nut allergy should stay away from chestnuts because it is a tree nut. And I think, you know what, I, I, I think this is what I hear all the time. Okay, how about those with an almond allergy? Uh, should, or, or, no, I should stay away from almond because it's a tree allergy, a tree nut. Um, what about walnuts? I mean, we can insert whatever nut we want, but I actually found this advice on about 10 different web pages um, as I was kind of looking through this and saying, now what are people seeing when they're given a diagnosis of tree nut or even peanut allergy, okay? And I think this, this is the advice that I think I want to kind of talk about, can we, can we move past this a little bit? And in some scenarios, this is gonna be a very reasonable thing, but in some scenarios, this advice actually may be harmful. Okay, and I, and I wanna walk you through that. So this is a changing paradigm and this might be very difficult for many of us. It's actually, to be frank with you, very difficult for many clinicians to get to change to change their practice. This was a great article. One of my friends, Brian Schroer, who actually we've worked with on a number of projects, um, wrote this article and it says, moving past, avoid all nuts. And it talks about individual management of children with peanut or tree nut allergies, okay? And I think this is where the paradigm is starting to shift a bit, okay? And I think, I think long-term, this is the direction that we're moving. We are starting to understand what does it look like for a patient who has a nut allergy? Um, do, they, do they commonly have other nut allergies? Do they, uh, you know, should they be avoiding all of these? And this study was done in Europe and in, in Switzerland, in England, and in Spain. And what they did is they took about 200 kids with one nut allergy and they decided to give them every other nut or major seed that, that they could do. So that was literally every single one. They did this in what's called a food, oral food challenge. Some of you may have had one of those or your children may have had one of those. Um, and they literally brought a kid in up to 10 times and they gave them these foods. They may have reacted, they may not have reacted, but this is what they did. A couple key takeaways from the study. The first is the older the child, the more likely they were to have multiple nut allergies. And what their conclusion was, that the secondary spread of nut allergies occurred as you got older. Now, many of you know about the LEAP study where they talked about the prevention of allergy for peanut allergy by giving it early. And what we're seeing is a very similar phenomenon here for tree nuts, where the avoidance of these nuts actually may have been harmful. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But this is, what, this is very similar to what we saw with the peanut LEAP study. But the other interesting things, things that we've been seeing for years in our clinic, is that there were actual defined groupings, okay? Not just tree nuts in general, but cashew and pistachio. They actually went, went together 97% of the time. So if you had a pistachio allergy, 97% of those kids had a cashew allergy. It didn't quite work the same amount going the other direction. So many children who had cashew allergy actually could tolerate pistachio allergy. And we see that all the time. 
Similarly, the other major grouping was walnut and pecan, 97% with pecan algae would react to walnut and only 75% of who had walnut algae could actually eat pecan. And we see this once again. So this is a shift. Once again, 15 years ago, we thought of tree nuts as a grouping of nuts. But what we're identifying through studies like this are that there are actually more defined families where you do see high cross reactivity, but outside of those families, you don't see the same degree. And that's, that is a very, very important part for the takeaway. Once again, the second part is that as children avoided these foods and grew older, they were more likely to develop these allergies. So that may shift how we manage these kids. So for example, if I had a child, an infant with one nut allergy, I may be more aggressive about getting nuts in than for example, a 25 year old who may have multiple nut allergies. And we can talk about that and go moving forward. So once again, as we shift through this, we, sh we kind of think, you know, we are moving from you now have a tree analogy to when I, I actually I'll never say that. I, I actually, these days, I don't think I've ever, I've said that for years. I, I will say you have a cashew, you have a cashew and pistachio allergy. You have a hazelnut cashew pistachio allergy, but I would almost never say you have a tree nut allergy. Now, part of this is in the past, we actually had, we, I don't think we appreciate the limitation that our, that our, blood work and our skin testings have. And I'm gonna show you kind of an example of that in a minute. We did panels, we did kind of you know, come into the allergist's office and you would, you know, you had a milk allergy. Well, guess what? You're gonna get tested for 10 different foods and you know, we'll see what happens. Um, we are trying to stop that practice of panel food testing where you go in for one thing and you come out with 10 others. You know, that to me is not uh, optimal. And we are actually writing a position statement through the King Society of Allergy about that to try to discourage that kind of um, testing. I know we know it still happens and, and, and there are scenarios where that may be reasonable. We have better diagnostic tests from a blood work perspective primarily, but we are recognizing that oral food challenges are the gold standard. Okay, and I think that this is something that we had 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 shied, of, shied away from for years, um, but we're recognizing that this is something that really needs to be done to keep, to be accurately diagnosing these kids. Um, and, you know, I think, why is this important? Because of unnecessary avoidance actually has negative um, negative effects. It can actually, encourage the development of an allergy uh, because these kids are not being taught at, an, at a younger age. I think of, you know, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, we also have better knowledge on individual thresholds, um, cross-contamination. What does that even look like? And then um, quality of life improvement. So here's a, what a food challenge can look like. This is a, a patient who's eating, looks like probably peanut butter-ish. Um, and we do this all the time um, overall food challenges are actually really, really very, very safe. Um, we know that reactions can absolutely occur, but epinephrine use in most food challenges is, is actually uncommon. Um, most patients can um, be managed with observation or antihistamine. Um, epinephrine, obviously, it can be required in some scenarios, but these are actually really, really very safe. Um, and, and we do a lot of these. The problem is that we know that there are barriers to these are, there are barriers across the country to getting these in. Um, and, and, and a lot of allergists have difficulty offering these. So this is something that I, we can certainly have a more a broader discussion on maybe in the questions, but this is something that I think we believe very firmly in. The food challenge is the gold standard. And there's lots of reasons. These are two articles. The one on the left-hand side demonstrated that patients that, that um, went through tree nut oral food challenges, whether they actually passed or whether they actually um, didn't pass or were successful or not successful with their challenge, they actually had an improvement in quality of life because uh, as you can see on the right, and this is a Canadian study where they actually had families actually in, use epinephrine um, and, and actually self-inject with their epinephrine auto injector, the parents and the families felt better. They, they actually had on the yellow bars, the one that you should be looking at here, um, they had improved recognition of anaphylaxis. They had improved um, knowledge on how to administer epinephrine auto injector, knowledge about kind of what an allergic reaction looks like and how it can be treated and reported improvement in skill for using epinephrine. So these these are all very positive things that can happen during an oral food challenge. And, um, and, and so I, I think that's a, that's a key thing. But in the past, like I said, panel testing, this, you may have seen this on your kid or, or maybe you had done yourself or you, and I did, I, I, mean, I, was, I was a kid just lying on the table and just, you know, 50 tests, yeah, why not just test everything. Um, and, and what I have to kind of, this is a very difficult concept. 
having a positive test in the field of allergy does not mean allergy. That is a very difficult concept for families and, and for doctors to kind of get. The test, our tests are very good at, well, let's say very good, they're good. These tests are good at confirming a reaction, but they are very poor at predicting whether you will react. That's a very difficult statistical concept that is actually, we call that pre-test probability and post-test probability. It, it actually really, changes your outcome and it shouldn't but it does okay and um, so let's take a look at this so this is a, a study looking at a number of different foods in infants who have eczema and i'm going to show you the close-up here these are all different foods and i'm going to show you peanut i'm going to explain this to you so on the bottom you can see that these patients had blood work levels done at that time okay you can see down to zero basically or up to 100 100 is the highest that we can measure when they looked at these kids and said, you know, uh, which one of these kids are actually allergic, you can see on the left-hand side, that's the probability. So let's walk through this. If a patient had, let's see here, a 0 0.8 in the blood work, they had about a 10% eh, chance of developing a peanut allergy in these infants with eczema. If they had 100, they had about 45% probability of having an allergy. That doesn't mean a kid with 100 IgE for that's an antibody for 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 um for peanut um allergy um has that probability but in this scenario they did but that's so think about this for a second flipping a coin in this scenario gave you a better option better better uh a diagnostic accuracy than our best test that doesn't mean in all scenarios this is going to be the case that doesn't mean with all patients this is going to be the case or age groups or scenarios or whatever but what i'm trying to show you is that our tests even in this academic study were not very predictive of developing peanut allergy in this population now if they had previously reacted we can change that curve and and and, and show different numbers and, and i'm not going to kind of get into that but this is the challenge when we test a kid who has never reacted to a food. We simply don't know how to interpret that. And once again, flipping a coin may be just as accurate. Let's look at almond. And here's almond. Here's one of our tree nuts, actually a droop. But anyways, this is another large study, academic center. And on the left-hand side, I'm going to focus in on the panel A. It says skin prick test size. And you can see there's an eight millimeter test. Look at how many kids actually failed the challenge, only 10% with a very large skin test. That means that 90% of those kids who had a, a very large skin test actually would have passed. Very few had anaphylaxis. The same kind of thing applied for our antibody levels. With a relatively high blood work on the, in the panel B, you can see when it's over 10, only 17% failed the challenge. That once again means 83 passed and very few had anaphylaxis. And I think this is what we are starting to learn. And every nut appears to be different. Every, you know, an eight for almond may be different from an eight millimeter for peanut versus an eight millimeter for cashew or an eight millimeter for walnut. And, and, and I think the keys from this study, I think this is actually, there were three articles in this year that were published that showed almost the exact same thing. And this is a start. This is where we start to say, and I love the critical thinking of some clinicians when they say, let's really think about this and decide, you know, what are, what are, what are, our, what are our tests even showing? Are they even reliable? Um, and in this scenario, clearly they're, they're not. The history of reaction is key. When this happened, what was eaten? How much was eaten? What were the symptoms? How long did they last for? What treatment was required? See, this to me is far more important than a test. What, I, what a family tells me, a uh, reaction is, is far more important than what our test is okay so whew. oh let's talk about some of these questions i know that uh and jennifer you have a number of them here and we're going to get back to some more of these discussions but uh let's okay uh, i'm going to ask you to turn on your uh, webcam dr mac perfect okay so we're going to uh, take a look at some of the questions that sort of relate to this section and then we'll turn it back to you to uh talk about the practical aspects of managing avoidance so the first set of questions were really around developing and outgrowing a tree nut allergy okay and you talked a little bit about the development of allergies uh, you know, the tree nut allergies as as a child ages but you know what's the what's the data on outgrowing great do, do people outgrow tree nut allergies they do 
Um, we estimate that around 10% of patients who have a tree nut allergy may outgrow that. Now, that's assuming that they actually had it to begin with, okay, and, that, and I think that that's part of this diagnostic uncertainty that we may actually be overestimating that potentially, but because many may not actually be allergic if they were diagnosed based on just testing, okay. Um, however, about 10% of patients will outgrow this. Now, I will tell you, the patients that tend to persist are patients who have confirmed multiple nut allergies. Patients that have very large skin testing or blood testing, those patients or patients who have more severe reactions, uh, multi-system reactions, those are patients that tend to persist, unfortunately. So that, that's typically the number that we quote. It may differ based on the type of nut, but that's what we tend to see. Okay. And then just to confirm the, the likelihood of developing a tree nut allergy if you have other new tree nut allergies, if you have one. Can you just restate, because you, you covered that off a little bit in the slides, but you know, what is the likelihood of developing additional tree nut allergies if you have one uh, to begin with? Okay, so easy for two of them, not so easy for the rest. Okay, so if you have a pistachio allergy, 97% chance you have a cashew allergy. That's it. Okay, guaranteed. Those two go together. In my mind, cashew pistachio goes together. If you have a pecan allergy, 97% chance you have a walnut allergy. Once again, those two go together. Beyond that, it's actually very difficult to know what those numbers look like. Um, and, and I think one of the challenges we face is that once given a, a label, many families will avoid all nuts and they kind of get labeled or they get tested for everything and they're positive. So it could be around one third. It could be 20%, it could be 10%. In fact, in, in Australia, they're actually doing a prospective study looking at infants and saying, actually, did our testing actually and telling them to avoid it cause that allergy? And so they are going from baseline and they are following these kids from a one year of age and they're going to say, like, look, what is the actual risk in an infant? And I, and I think it's much lower than we had previously thought. Okay. Okay. Now we had a question come in, a clarifying question around oral food challenge, and this is in terminology, okay? So when we talk about an oral food challenge, reminds what does a fail mean and what does a pass mean, okay? Because this is terminology that seems, you know, confusing. Agreed. So can you just clarify that? Yep. So for those of you that don't know, um, an oral food challenge is where we give small amounts of a food to diagnose an allergy, not to treat it, okay? To diagnose, to properly diagnose it. We start with a very small amount and we gradually increase the amount until either a child does one of two things, either passes and they can eat as much food as I give them, you know, 20 peanuts or something like that. That's what we consider a successful or a past food challenge. If a child reacts, that's the other option, um, or they don't eat it because they don't like it. That's the other option. Um, they, they will be consider either an unsuccessful or a, a failed challenge. Okay. So if they react during the challenge, that's what we would consider either a failed or an unsuccessful challenge. And there are terminology challenges around that as well. Right. Okay. Um, also on the topic of um, outgrowing, so if a patient developed an allergy later on, a tree nut allergy later on in life, is it possible that it resolves? Unlikely. Once you, so you kind of have these kind of two patterns. One is, you know, you either have, you know, you develop when you're early and then you just start growing. Most adults, unfortunately, if they develop a true tree nut allergy, it does tend to persist as, as time goes on. It kind of, you know, it, it develops. The immune system says, this is what I'm going to recognize as an allergy, and off we go. And I, and I think this is, the immune system is amazing. I, I, I think about this for a second. When I think about allergies, um, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing mistake that the body's making. Because like, it should never think, you know, even grass pollen. I mean, why, like, why, does, why does my body even think that grass pollen is harmful or dust mite? I mean, it's such a benign thing. It's never going to harm me. Same thing with nuts. I mean, the, we... It, it, we really shouldn't be reacting to it. It's a mistake that the body's making. And once it makes that mistake, it can be very difficult for the body to unlearn that mistake, okay? The body's smart to an extent, but once it starts making those mistakes, it's very difficult for us to change that. And, and, and that's what I, how, how, how I look, especially with infants. I think that's... Okay, now some questions about reaction severity, okay? Mm. Is there any evidence around by different type of tree nut that some tree nuts are more likely to have to trigger a severe reaction than others is there any data on that potentially potentially um in general we find that almonds tend to have mild reactions as you kind of saw in that um in that um previous study 
there is some speculation that foods such as cashews, potentially, or even walnuts may be more likely to lead to an anaphylactic reaction. However, the challenges we face in this kind of concept is, is, is that much of a individual reaction characteristic depends on the amount that was eaten potentially, the patient's underlying characteristics, whether they have asthma, whether they have asthma that's controlled or not, whether they you know, are sick at the time, whether they exercise in conjunction. So uh, defining severity is actually a very difficult thing for us to be able to do. Um, and, and I think that it can fluctuate, it can change, it can change on the, on the, the age of the patient and the time of the patient's life. Um, so it's a vague answer. I don't think we have a firm one. We need better studies to say, okay, for this patient at this time, they get, both are allergic to both of these. Let's see what this one looks like in a food challenge and what this one looks like. It's just hard to get that data. Okay, a couple more questions before we go back to the next section. Does cooking a tree nut make it less allergenic? I'm not even going to get into pollen food syndrome today, but there is a, and I, know, I, know, I think uh, you guys had a talk on this not long yeah, ago. Yeah, we do. And, and I've got some resources that I can refer people to at the end. Maybe that's the best thing. But in general, are, I, I, isn't it that tree nuts are not that label, heat label? So heating it, unlike for things like milk or for egg, right. heating does not reduce the allergenicity except for potentially in pollen food syndrome. And I'm not even going to get into that today. Okay. Okay. Perfect. We'll come back to that at the end so that there's some more resources for people on that. Um, and then I just, this one last question, then I want to go back, go on to the managing avoidance. You know, we Great. hear this a number of times. We heard this through some of the questions that came through the survey around allergic reactions worsen each time with its subsequent exposure. Fact Absolutely. or fiction? Fiction. And, and I think this is... This is a colloquial understanding, and once again, we talked about just what is what what determines reaction severity, and and it, there are so many factors that determine. I have kids who uh, will have a severe reaction one day, and six months later they'll have a mild one, and 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 that and, and it does not, you know, you can, it, I, people often think of it as a, you know, I I have three chances, you know, mild, medium, severe, that's how it's going to go, and that is absolutely not the case. Um, now. It may be the case that an infant may have a milder reaction than potentially a 20 year old. Okay, that is, that is, there is data to support that. And I think that that is, we know that infants in general have a predisposition towards lower reaction severity. And that's just something we see clinically all the time. So there is that potential. Okay. But that does not mean that having the next dose is now going to cause a, a more severe reaction. And that, that's, that's a very common question that I, I, I hear this every single day as well, Jennifer. Right. Okay, okay. So let's go on to the next section. This is like, we seem to be living in a tree nut label world, okay? And so let's really talk about the practical aspects to managing the avoidance of tree nuts. And, and let's explore this in the next session. You know, if I'm allergic to one nut, should I avoid them all? Okay, so let's, let's I'm gonna turn off my camera and turn it back to you. Okay, let's go through this here, okay. So the first question, I think, you know, as you are all contemplating this and you're thinking, maybe I should introduce them, maybe you shouldn't. Okay. The first thing I want to say to everybody here is before we even get into this is that what works for one family will not work for everybody. I have, if this is based on a quality of life issue, there are many factors towards this. So for example, in some cultures, hazelnuts and walnuts are very, very common, often in Eastern European. Uh, Italian, uh, we may see hazelnut. Uh, in some Asian cooking, we may see more cashews. And so culturally, this may be very important for us to be able to have maybe just the cashews in the diet, but not walnuts or hazelnuts or, or whatever. So for some families, the, the even the discussion about should I be introducing these other nuts, uh, it may actually worsen quality of life. But for some families, avoiding all nuts actually may be... <laughs> You know, that may actually worsen quality. So I think, that, you know, I have, we have to be sensitive to this. But as we're thinking, you know, can we even, if we're thinking of maybe at one time we might start to introduce these, some of these nuts, uh, can we even tell the difference? And I am going to just 
you on the bottom left there, you can see that hard nut with the shell. That's what I mean by a tree nut with hazelnut. You know, that hard shell kind of there on the bottom left hand side of that picture. And you can see one on the very right side of that bowl as well, um, kind of with that li with the lines on it. So let's tell the difference of the actual nuts with their shells off. Okay, so I'd encourage you to get a piece of paper if you don't have one, or just make a mental note and see if you get these right. I'm gonna go through a couple of nuts and write them down or kind of make a mental note if you can identify what this nut looks like, what this nut is. There's a kind of a, this is from my friend Brian Shore, that's why it's an American uh, dime. Okay, so that's the first nut. Here is the second nut. Maybe it's a droop. Here's the third one. Do the one on the right, not the one on the left. The one on the left is a is well, I'll spoil it. It's a peanut, clearly. Uh, but but just to give a term of reference as to what this looks like. Okay, there's that one. If you know what that one is, I'll give you time to write that down. Here's another one. The one on the right, that's the one I'm kind of looking for, the bigger one with all the crazy grooves on it. Okay, let's go to the next one. Kind of looks not dissimilar to that other one. That might give you a bit of a clue. Okay, and on to the next one. I'm looking at the one on the right, the, the greenish colored one. That might be a giveaway. There may be duplicates on this one, I'm just gonna warn you. And here is another one. It's the one on the right-hand side. Okay, let's see how you do. Here are the results. Uh, the top one on the left was almond. The next one was cashew. Once again, split in half because a cashew comes in two, uh, often two halves. But it, you know, if you think about this, if you were to break that up, into pieces, it would look not dissimilar to that peanut right beside it onto the onto, in, in the next uh, in the next frame. You just to take a you know break it up, and you might look very similar. Maybe some of you thought it was a peanut. This one is hazelnut. The number three is hazelnut. It has that dark skin on there. Um, that's what most hazelnuts will have. It and, and I'll actually dif differentiate that in just a second. Walnut is the next one. Often looks very similar to pecan, and that's why we kind of put them side by side there. They're often confused, but once again, cross reactive. Very very cross-reactive for many families or many patients. There's pecan next. The green one is pistachio. And the final one is once again, hazelnut. And the reason I put hazelnut on here twice is because it, it looks kind of like a macadamia nut. That one of the distinguishing features is that most hazelnuts uh, may still have a residual skin on it, whereas macadamia does not. Okay, um, and there we go. So those are your kind of seven main ones that we deal with on a, on a regular basis, seven of the colloquialized tree nuts. So what about cross-contamination? Because I think this has been one of the biggest challenges that we've been facing is, can we even get these other nuts into these kids uh, if they're processed in, a, in a, an environment where there are, are, you know, are other tree nuts? Because guess what? By definition, if you uh, buy a product that has tree nuts in it, it will say, may contain, does contain tree nuts, and not may contain, it does contain tree nuts, um, or process in a facility with other tree nuts. It may well. Okay, there are some companies that have, uh, I can think of one, uh, Barney Butter, which has uh, is almond. It has no other nuts or seeds or anything else in there. That just it's simply almonds. Um, but it can be challenging to find. Um, so, you know, I think what's important to understand, and this is a we talk about risk assessment and um, thresholds, and what is the dose that is required for a patient to react, uh, it's different for every patient. So you may hear terms EDO5, EDO1, ED50. So the, the ED means eliciting dose, that's how much you have to eat. The 50 means for 50% 50 of the population to react. What's I think really striking, take a look at a peanut. This is for peanut. We had the best data for peanuts. For peanut, like that's almost a full peanut that we're looking at there, and not quite a full peanut, it's maybe 50% or 75%, but but still a, a lot of the peanut, 50% of the population can actually eat a peanut. Now, not, if you're gonna go to the left-hand side there, 99% of patients will uh, not react to that very small amount, but these are all visible amounts, and that's important. So when I have a kid who has a cashew allergy and I have a cashew in front of me, and I'm not seeing particulate matter on that cashew, the probability of them reacting 
is very low, and the probability of having a significant reaction is even lower. Okay, and that that's really really important. Sometimes kids may have subjective symptoms, mouth symptoms, but the probability of having a reaction to an invisible particle of nut is very, very, very low. Not zero, extremely low. Here are other doses. I mean, this is going to probably surprise a lot of you. Uh, I think this is the amount that it takes that 50% of patients who are egg allergic, wheat allergic, milk allergic, or, or sesame allergic to be able to eat. That means 50% will react. 50% won't react. And this was just published uh, just recently in 2022. Once again, this is all based on thresholds and everybody has a threshold. It might be higher, might be lower, may change with time. Okay, if you have less than that, you will not react. If you have more than that or equal to that, you will probably react. Okay, and that's what this, how this works. Thresholds are a newer concept that I think we're just grappling with. And I think it has changed how we look at this because the vast majority of patients can tolerate a very, very small amount of cross-contamination if it is worth it. And I'll talk about that in a second. So what are the higher risk foods? I'm just going to consider for a second. I'm not going to poll you guys or whatever else, but what do you consider high risk for potential uh, cross-contamination? Baked goods, chocolate, ice cream, burgers and fries, candies, basically everything my 15-year-old teenage son likes to eat on a daily basis. All of this the only one in here that probably is very low risk is burger and fries. The other ones are higher risk, and I'm going to go through some of that data in a second. Um, this is, once again, the best data we have is for peanut, um, and the ranges of, of cross-contamination in this review range anywhere from about 1% or 2% um, up to about 32%. But the average for most foods that we find is about 10% of, of common snack foods. Those are the ones that I was talking to you about earlier, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, around the world, this is what they look like. Um, and that can include chocolate, chocolate-based foods, spreads, cookies, biscuits, you know, uh, you know, Lara bars. I mean, th these are a disaster for us. These kids, there's so many reactions to cashews and Lara bars. Anyways, thanks to Costco samples. Um, baked goods, ice cream. These are relatively higher risk foods, but not not 100%. And I think what we're seeing on the market, once again, we talked about this earlier, is that there are companies like Royal Nuts, and I'm <laughs> no affiliation with them whatsoever, but that are now starting to make nuts that are peanut free. Um, they have individual ones for almonds and cashews and you know walnuts, et cetera. Um, there are limited supplies for people who have multiple nut or uh, nut allergies, tree nut allergies, um, where where they have uh, tree nut with single source like almonds, et cetera. So we are seeing this. I mean, I think there are other strategies. There are strategies that I tell families as well. I mean, that, that that some people will visually inspect the nuts. Some people will buy intact nuts. Uh, and crack them open, and then they're going to have their child eat the nuts. Um, once again, visual inspection for many of these is quite reasonable. The ones that I tend to shy away from are going to be ones like uh, nut crumbles, you know, nuts that have been crumbled up or pieces of them. That's very difficult to identify um, and may be very difficult to, to tease out. And now, once again, for some kids, this may not be the right strategy. And for some families, this is not going to be the right strategy. But there are approaches that we can take that that may either reduce or minimize the risk or may not be risky at all in the first place. And then the question I think we have to ask ourselves is, is there a reason why I should be getting these into my kids? And, and I think that's something we'll talk about in, in the next in the next area, in the next um, section. But the question is, should we be getting these into these kids? And, and my, for most families, uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Let's go to the questions. All right, if you want to turn your camera back on, Dr. Mack. So, you know, first, before we get into some of the questions, there was quite a few things that came up about, you know, um, uh, how do you find products that have, have not been cross-contaminated with other nuts? And I just wanted to let people know now that we are asking you in the survey following this webinar to provide your suggestions where you've come across products where, like Barney Butter, as an example, that you've found have, uh, have been able to manage that uh, cross-contamination of tree nuts, please put it in the survey, okay? Please indicate that because we're happy to share that information with um, all the other participants. Um, the other thing too is just, we also had some questions around, you know, what's Food Allergy Canada doing around may contain labeling when it comes to may contain tree nut? And I want you to know that this is absolutely on our radar screen. 
may contain is not regulated. There is guidance that Health Canada does provide to be able to say they are asking uh, manufacturers to be specific about the tree nuts instead of using may contain tree nuts as a category and, and be specific. Um, so we are working on that and we are working on trying to move that conversation forward towards a regulatory basis. So just wanted to do that before we go on to some of these other things. So we did get some questions. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, seems, it seems like they're just kind of cover their cover their butts to some degree. And, and yeah. that's not always the case. I mean, I get that. I, it, yeah. Just for some families, this is going to be very important to have that label on there. But for some, you know, I, I've seen coffee with may contain shellfish. I mean, there's no right. chance it's got, you know, right. and, and this is where we're right. So right. I and, appreciate and, your efforts. And we, yeah. yeah, and we are, we're trying to make may contain meaningful and we've got lots of efforts in, underway uh, on that. But I want to go to some of the questions that got pre-submitted and to some of the ones that just came in. So it, this one goes back to the botanical families, okay? There's a few questions around avoiding foods in a botanical family. So, you know, maybe it's not avoiding all tree nuts, but maybe it's, I, I need to avoid the botanical family. So, for example, this person asked, I'm allergic to mango, cashews, and pistachios, all from the poison ivy family. Are there other foods that I need to avoid? And similarly, another person asked, if I'm allergic to cashews, do I need to avoid things that are in the cashew family, such as sumac? So the answer is, so great question. That, that's actually com quite complex. Um, the first question about cashews, pistachios, mangoes, we know that the proteins that you're going to encounter that, uh, that may have some botanical similarity are not going to be part of the fruit of a mango okay that's really important so that the fruit of a mango actually should be very well tolerated for almost every patient now, not every patient but, but for the vast majority of patients who have a cashew or pistachio allergy okay so i don't recommend ever recommend blanket avoidance of mangoes and few of us will it still is in the textbooks like uh from 30 40 years ago but it's still it's an it's an evolving concept that's hard to kind of change mindsets the skin is different from mangoes, and that, that's actually a, a very different type of reaction, which is similar to poison ivy, which is more of a call of a contact dermatitis. There's a chemical that looks very similarly, but that is completely different than cashew pistachio allergy, okay? And, that, and that's really important. So I never tell families who have a poison ivy issue that because of the mango skin, which is maybe in the same family as cashew pistachio, that they should now then avoid cashew with pistachio. That would never be a recommendation that I would ever see that is reasonable. It's a very different mechanism. There's absolutely no correlation there. So similarly with sumac in general, we don't recommend, in general, I would, you're going to find most of the evolving uh, advice is not blanket avoidance of family. So I've heard, you know, do I avoid nightshades because of X, Y, or Z? The answer is in general, no. We want to be very specific. You know, if you've reacted to this, once again, even if you have a cashew allergy, you may not have a pistachio allergy. And if you have a walnut allergy, you still have a 25% chance of having a, a pecan uh, uh, tolerability. So, you know, even within those, it's still not black and white. Um, hmm. and, and I think that that's that's that is, you know, in the end, you are going to, you know, I hate hasten to, or I, I hate to offer. You know specific advice so talking to your your doctor about this specifically is going to always be the most important part of any discussion but those are the general principles that we're trying to use these days okay terrific um okay around someone who might be interested in getting some of those different nuts into their diet this question is around is washing or retoasting the nuts a solution to deal with potential issues associated with cross-contamination no evidence to support it like there's no data there's no article that I'm aware of, but maybe you guys are, but I, I've not seen an article about that, but it's a practical step. Once again, I always think of that threshold. If it's, if it is, if I see an intact piece of nut, a cashew, and I can't see other particles on there that are quite visible, even if they are minuscule, uh, like the chances of that causing an issue are, are very, very small um, and a significant issue, even smaller, not zero. So intact nuts, if you want to wash them and get rid of what any particulate on there, totally a reasonable thing to do. But the probability of a relevant amount of cross-contamination, I think that's important. Re what is cross-contamination? What is relevant to that patient is 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 is, is going to vary. Um, and it, I don't think washing is a, a bad idea. But we have no data. But to, kind to of a full it, nut to be able to see it, that you know that it's a intact nut. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's how I look at it. Okay. So um, nut oils, like should people yeah. be avoiding nut oils? 
Now, that's another very, very good question. When you make an oil, you are basically taking the fat, okay? And, and the, the reactive part for a patient who has a food allergy is the protein. You make an antibody to the protein, not to the fat. So you're trying to remove that. Uh, there are some clear-cut, well, I shouldn't say clear-cut. Um, there are some um, scenarios where it's very easy to say, yeah, for most patients with peanut allergy, they can have peanut oil. And when I'm talking about peanuts here, and not every patient, and it depends on the type of peanut oil. You know, most commercially grade, that, where you can heat it to a very high temperature, there should be no protein in there, or very, very little. Um, it's a, it may be a bit different, however, for things like walnut oil, al almond oil. So these may have higher amounts for, for which some patients may have a threshold that just, you know, determines that they may react to those, okay? And I think that's because they haven't been processed to the same degree as most commercial grade peanut oil. So it's not a straight answer. Uh, I'm gonna, in general, if families are, are, are concerned, do we really need to eat walnut oil? I mean, I think that, you know, so in that scenario, is the risk worth it? Uh, that's a decision that I think families have to make in conjunction with their, with their doctor, but it's relatively low risk. Okay, what about um, tree nuts in personal care products? So whether it's in you know creams or shampoos or what what's the advice there? Yeah, it, it, what it will likely do is lead to a, a significant local reaction. So and I and I've seen this before with walnut in um, in ex, uh, exfoliants. So that, that's that's word. Right. I, I don't. Yeah, anyways. Uh, so, but when people have used that, they have developed localized reactions. So, you know, when you talk about uh, food reactions. Anaphylaxis is going to be dependent on ingestion in almost every single case. Now, there are cases where that hasn't happened, but that, those are very, very few and, probably, and reportable. Um, and so local reaction uh, is the most common thing that we might see, eye irritation, that kind of thing. So in general, yeah, be sensible about it. If you have a, uh, you know, a, a walnut allergy, don't use products that contain right. walnut specifically in them. Yeah. And probably not food, uh, uh, lotions with food on babies? Ideally not. Um, that's a whole other discussion, but it, yeah. it's interesting. We try to recommend avoidance of food on the skin in babies, with, especially if there's no oral exposure. Right. Um, and, and because we think, and that I have to get, keep going back to this, the, the best way to teach a baby that food is okay is guess what? By giving them the food and not putting it on their skin, not putting, so, <clears throat> If they're just getting on their skin and they have a history of eczema, that may actually cause allergy. So I see, you know, patients who put, right. uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. But but they put it on their skin, and that may in fact contribute to the development right. of allergy right. down the road. Okay, two more questions before we go back to uh, kind of the moving forward section. So the risk of um, like so trees around the question around trees yeah. for those who have a walnut or a hazelnut allergy, you got a black walnut you know, tree in your backyard, you know, what, what's, what's the thinking there? Yeah. Once again, I think that ingestion is the, is the, is the key here. Uh, and it depends on the age of the child. I mean, a two, a one-year-old who's picking everything up and putting it in their mouth. Hey, this looks good. You know, that kid would still have to break down the, you know, the fruit and then break down the shell and then, and then, and then get in there and, and cause and, and eat the, eat the, the nut. Um, but a 15-year-old would be very different. And, and I think, so there, there is age to discuss there, but once again, they have to eat it to cause for almost every single kid okay. to have a, a reaction. Skin contact, yes, might cause a hive, but they have to eat it. Okay. So I see that we've got about six minutes left. I just want to let our audience know that we will go over the hour just so that uh, you know that we're not going to cut this short. Um, so uh, Dr. Mack, I hope that's fine with you. Okay, so let's go back, let's go to the moving forward because, you know, like let's kind of try and wrap this all up around what does this mean? How do we move forward? Uh, whether you're someone who's been diagnosed 20 years ago and, you know, with a tree nut allergy through a panel test, you know, is it, or you're a mother of a small child who has a sibling with a tree nut allergy and you kind of wonder what should I be doing? So let's provide, uh, get, give the audience some perspective on the path forward. Once again, this is changing. And I think, um, here we go. Okay, so I think from my perspective, when I look at my patients, I think we wanna be diagnostically accurate. That, that's just the reality. I think I wanna provide a proper diagnosis. I don't want to provide a diagnosis that is, well, I think you're allergic to this. Uh, you may not be. It, 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 
it's a very different story to tell a family to avoid one nut than it is to avoid 10, especially if these are culturally relevant allergens or culturally relevant foods. Uh, and so from a quality of life perspective, you know, there are, once again, there are people who just say, it's just easier for me to avoid all nuts. I'm just going to do that. That that improves my quality. Like, okay, great. Do that. That's totally, you know, what you are entitled to do. And for families who've lived for 30 years with us, as Jennifer was saying, yeah, that may be a very reasonable thing. But especially in our pediatric population, determining what this really is from an early age is important uh, psychologically uh, to help these kids understand that, that yes, it is, it is these ones specifically. Um, the other thing is, okay, think about this. Once again, we're talking about teaching a new language to these patients and teaching them that this is okay. If you talk, think about an infant, you're teaching them a new language, like Spanish. I mean, I couldn't learn, learn uh, I don't know, whatever, a language at my age to any reasonable degree. But, but if I were to teach a one-year-old, that's a very different story. And the same thing applies with when it comes to, to tree nuts. Think of this, almost, you know, you've heard talks about oral immunotherapy, et cetera. Well, you know what, let's, I have get lots of consults for kids who want to come to me for peanut immunotherapy or whatever. And we say, listen, let's put that on hold for just a second. I want to get the other nuts into your child so that they can, this is a, you know, this is a really, really low risk form of, call it immunotherapy, call it whatever you want, but let's just get those nuts in there to prevent the development of allergy. That to me, this, this is time sensitive. This is, this is important, um, especially for our infants and, and toddlers and young children. Um, and, you know, we talk about therapies. I don't want to treat you if you're not allergic. I have loads of patients who come to us with 10 different nut allergies and they walk out with actually after we do all our blood work or skin testing or food challenges, they only have one, maybe two allergies. And I think I don't want to treat you for 10 different foods if you are only allergic to one or two. It, it, it's just what we shouldn't be doing. And this was a study I like from, from the States and they looked specifically at patients that were coming for immunotherapy. And I'm gonna walk you through. Let's take a look on the right-hand side of this graph. And what you can see here are for peanuts and tree nuts. The black bar means this is how many patients that were referred for immunotherapy. This is what they're, they're referred for treatment, active, definitive treatment. Um, for peanuts, about 25% had had a history of reaction. For about six or seven percent of tree nuts, only had had a reaction. The rest were based were avoiding these foods because of skin testing, or fear of cross contamination. That's that kind of lighter gray bars. They were avoiding only because of a concern of cross-contamination or because of skin testing. This is concerning from my perspective, and we see this all the time. This is what really has changed our, our way of thinking, that a documented reaction was rare and elimination was based on the fear of cross-contamination. The overuse of allergy testing led to a diagnosis of multiple allergies leading to an unnecessary elimination diet. But what was most concerning, and we see this all the time, is that the testing rates increased and the positive testing increased with time, suggesting that some of these tree nut allergies developed while the families were avoiding it. This is what we saw in that first study that I showed you in 20, um, published in 2020 about in, in Europe. Very, very similar outcomes. And I think this is where it actually matters because we, if I have a kid who's eating almond, why am I testing them for almond? If I have a kid who, you know, has a peanut allergy, why am I testing them for all the nuts on the off chance that maybe we're going to pick something up? But guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to instill in, in the family's mind that they now need to avoid all of these nuts when they may not need to. And, and that will actually do harm. And so, I, you know, the, the, the precept in medicine is first do no harm. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that, that potentially in the past, that's what, what I, I may have done. I know I did. So what do you do with your baby? I, I tell families, you know, continue to introduce foods, keep up with the exposure. Now this could be challenging because, you know, on one day you're giving almond, on one day you're giving hazelnut, one day you're giving cashew, Brazil nut, et cetera, you know, you, you name it. You could go down the list and have a schedule for every single day that you give these foods, peanut, and how much do I give? I don't think we know the answer. Um, 
but I think, and how frequently do I give this? It may depend on the kid and their risks. We did publish a recipe for mixed nut butter um, where you can just make your own nut butter. I mean, this is, you can make your own. You can pick your own peanut free or you can pick your own individual nuts. You can make your own nut butter, um, put it in a food processor, add a bit of oil. It's, it's amazing. It, it works. Now, I'm going to caution you. This, this recipe has peanut on there. If you have a peanut allergy, don't put it on there. Don't put it in the mix. That's all I'm going to say to you. Um, cashew, same story. If you have cashew allergy, don't put it in. But the other ones can be put in there. And these babies actually tend to like this. So this is something that I, I do recommend for many of our families, once again, excluding the nuts that they are allergic to. Um, sesame is another one. You know, sesame is another, you put tahini in here too. Great, delicious, get it in there. Um, and so there are options. I don't think there's a right option for every kid, but having some degree of regular exposure is really important. And for some of our very allergic kids, it is it is fundamental to preventing them from developing an allergy. The challenge is we don't know how much to give. We don't know how often to give it. We don't know how long to give this for. The LEAP data suggested three times a week at a relatively high amount for, for five years. Yeah, for some kids, that's going to be necessary. But the reality is incorporating this into your diet on a conscientious basis is probably just as important. I see lots of kids who go to the emergency department or to their pediatrician and they've had a, a reaction to peanut and the doctor says, okay, at this point, until you see the allergist, avoid all nuts. And I, I kind of bristle when I hear that because what we are doing is we are, we are eliminating the possibility that this child can get that food in a timely manner. I'm not saying that for some kids, this is not going to be reasonable advice. For some kids, it is. But for the majority of kids, when I see them in my clinic after a peanut reaction, I almost immediately say, listen, the most important thing we are going to do is get your baby to introduce these foods sooner rather than later so that we can teach them that this is reasonable. Now, this, I, you know, for, for those of you that are listening with older kids, you know, I, 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 this is challenging because you may have been given different advice, and and I and and I and I, and I can kind of, I, I can hear some of the 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 the, the concern, and, and 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 I see this all the time. Um, talking to your allergist about getting definitive testing where we can do food challenges for many of these families, even though they're 15, 16, 20, 25. Believe me, uh, it can still be beneficial. Um, and 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 maybe you're at the point now where where this is not going to be reasonable. Your kid doesn't want to even want to eat at this point. Okay, that's it. This is where we are, and that's and you're and that's very reasonable. But for some of our kids, if if families want to pursue this further, there are avenues to do that to prevent and accurately diagnose these allergies. So you know that's kind of my you know if I were to kind of sum this up, um, this has to be individualized. Uh, I think, but for some of our for our younger children getting that in there sooner rather than later is going to be so so key um and, and it's what we deal with on a, on a daily basis so i'm going to turn that back over to you jennifer now for any final questions um and uh and i look forward to kind of seeing where this discussion continues to go this has changed i mean this is this yeah. is something that we are we are grappling with it is every doctor sees this slightly differently um and it is a challenge when you institute change even peanut prevention how do we do that effectively Right. We all interpret it different ways, and this is part of it as well. Yeah. So, you know, I think you, there was a, there some amazing things to be thinking about. Um, I do want you to go back to that scenario of, you know, I've got a 23-year-old son. He was labeled with a tree nut allergy, and he was told to avoid. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, and I know you've covered this off, but I'd like you to kind of restate it again, like, what should they do? Well, if they've been labeled as that, I, I don't want you to all of a sudden just go home and, and eat these foods. You know, I, I tell them to eat these foods. I think that you do need a careful assessment by an allergist who can do blood work. You know, if you've been tested for 10 years, there are new blood tests out there that are much more definitive at determining is this a true allergy or not. Not great, not always. Some of them are awesome. Some of them aren't perfect. They're never 100%, but they are better at helping us to determine those things. Um, and so that, that's, that's the first thing. Um, Ask for food challenges. I think that these are often overlooked. I think these are labor intensive for doctors. They are um, challenging to perform from a clinic perspective. Having someone in your office for four hours, especially during COVID is, or, or whatever this was, um, you know, is, is challenging. But I think this is our gold standard. 
And, and I think I've had so many kids who come through us and they, they are not allergic, but I would say, don't do this on your own. You do need a conscientious allergist who's going to be able to provide you with up-to-date information and a supportive food challenge, uh, ideally in office. So that's how I would approach them. If, if, okay. if they're 23 years interested, I see a lot of te later right. teens, I don't think pediatric who just say, I don't care. You know, this doesn't matter to me. I'm, but it, it can. And yeah. So that options. question of, is it, to what degree is avoiding tree nuts affecting your quality of life? Absolutely. Right. If, if it yeah. isn't, and it's no burden for some kids, the right advice is avoid. Right. It's not wrong. Right. Okay. Um, uh, the other thing, I, I know we didn't want to talk too much about pollen food allergy syndrome. Okay. And I will uh, bring forward um, uh, the resources on that in just a moment. But can you just give people, for those in our listening audience, just a description of what pollen food allergy syndrome is? Because I think some of them might be going, oh, does this, you know, is this something I need to be concerned about? I have a tree nut allergy, right? So okay. can you just so, give us, you know, that, uh, that sound bite? For sure. So when we talk about, about allergy, once again, it's a mistake the body makes. And the body, once it makes a mistake, it likes to make other mistakes that are similar to that. Okay. So say, for example, you have a birch pollen or a grass pollen allergy or a ragweed allergy. Birch pollen and grass are probably the most relevant ones here. The body is always looking for things that might kind of look like that in this scenario. Uh, and it says, hey, that uh, hazelnut kind of looks like birch pollen. Let's react to it. That almond kind of looks like birch pollen. Let's react. To that peanut kind of looks like birch pollen. Let's react to it, okay? Generally, it's quite mild. Often mouth symptoms, mouth irritation, swelling of the lips, a bit of rash, throat symptoms. You might see this with other foods like almond, I mean, apples and peaches and pears. And the cool thing is that when you cook and heat those, um, those foods, generally the reactivity disappears or, or lessens significantly. Um, so it's generally a mild form of food allergy. Um, it isn't without its challenges. It can cause significant reaction, but it's very unlikely to do so. Um, but it's based on that kind of pollen cross reactivity. And I will point out that it almost never, it doesn't happen in infants because you have to have the birch or the grass pollen allergy first. So anyone who says a one-year-old has a oral allergy syndrome or pollen food allergy, okay. it, it isn't. It, it is a true allergy or it's not, you know, and I think, okay. but our older kids, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, these are patients who may develop because they've had years and years of birch and grass pollen allergy. Right, right. And I guess like we were talking about before, it's getting that proper diagnosis and it's probably helpful to know whether it's pollen food allergy syndrome that is triggering it or whether it's an IgE mediated. So yes. 100%. Okay. All right. Well, listen, um, I think we have taken up enough of your time today. We really appreciate your expertise. Um, so I'd like to, to thank you, Dr. Mack, uh, for uh, joining us. I'm going to go on to just a, a few of the, the resources that we mentioned um, in our uh, conversation for further understanding. We've got some uh, we've got some tools around oral food challenges for people who want to learn more about the role of the oral food challenge. Uh, understanding the severity of your food allergy is also um, a, a really good webinar that really talks about thresholds. Um, and understanding oral allergy syndrome or pollen food syndrome, which we were just talking about before, um, take a look at those webinars. There's some really good uh, insights in there, and you might find those resources particularly helpful. So as a reminder, uh, you will get a short survey through the GoToWebinar format immediately after. It'll pop up on your screen and you'll receive a survey in, in an email in the next hour or so. We really appreciate if you could take a moment to complete it. It will help us understand your information needs. We're also asking for your input on some labeling related things related to may contain tree nuts. So please do fill that out. And again, I'll reiterate, we've also asked for those of you who have found tree nut products that are free from cross-contamination with other tree nuts, please let us know which brands they are that you've uh, been able to find, and we'd be happy to share your recommendations with other participants. Um, also, uh, it is the time of year for giving, and we hope you'll consider supporting our charity, become a part of, food, of Canada's food allergy future, and help us to continue to make transformational change Visit foodallergycanada.ca backslash holidays to learn more about how you can make an impact. Plus, you'll also find a host of holiday tips and resources to help you navigate the holidays with confidence. Today's webinar was supported by the Walter and Maria Schroeder Foundation, Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, 
EpiPen, and the Peanut Bureau of Canada and made possible from the donations of viewers like you. Thank you for your participation in today's webinar. You can view a recording of this webinar at foodallergycanada.ca shortly. Please also share with others who may benefit from this content. This now concludes our webinar.